Fanjo drove it in practice a few laps, and he liked it and was quite impressed with it. Everybody paid attention to that car. John Cooper Fitch was born in August of 1917 in Indianapolis, Indiana. His stepfather, George Spindler, was then division sales chief for Stutz Automotive in Indiana. John recalls, one of my most vivid memories as a child was in the bucket seat of a thundering Stutz at full throttle around the oval at Indy as he was hanging on desperately while his stepfather manhandled the big racing wheel. During World War II, John served as an Air Corps pilot over Europe. He was a P-51 uh, pilot, uh, was one of the, the first uh, 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 flyers to shoot down a German jet. He was shot down over Nuremberg and taken prisoner by the Nazis, but he returned to the United States following VE Day. First of all, he was, he was a, a, an established uh, racing driver uh, at the time. Of course, he didn't you know, just jump out of the, the woodwork. He had been the first um, uh, national championship uh, champion of the Sports Car Club of America. Uh, he had uh, already been to uh, uh, Le Mans. Uh, he had already won uh, the Sebring race with Phil Walters in 53. Uh, he had already been on the Mercedes uh, team, which was really the, the toughest and best team of the early uh, 50s. Uh, he was uh, on the, the Mercedes team on two occasions, Mexican road race and also in, in Europe. Ed Cole, who was then chief engineer at Chevy, asked Briggs Cunningham if he could suggest someone who could make the fledgling American sports car, the Corvette, a player on the performance sports car scene. You know, one of the really important things that John Fitch did back in the 50s was he was actually hired by Ed Cole to work on the SR projects, which were the Sebring race cars in 1956. So he actually spent time working for Chevrolet Engineering on that project. I think the RPO was called uh, RPO 449 at the time, but we produced several cars back in the 50s that John Fitch had a, a real big hand in. Well, he certainly uh, was the first man to take the... Uh the, the fledgling Corvette of 1953, 4, and 5, and help educate General Motors Corporation into what it would take to make this a competitive race car with the European cars. And you know, these cars, when they first uh, uh, arrived at Sebring, could not even complete a single lap. It's a long course, 5.2 miles, but they couldn't even complete a single lap without something breaking. Uh, John worked and worked and worked, and finally got to the point where uh, he said, well, uh, you know, the cars are ready enough. And, and Andy Rosenberg said to him, uh, you know, uh, if, just before the race, if we never ran these Corvettes in a race at all, everything that we have done had, would have been so worthwhile uh, that, you know, uh, it almost was unnecessary to, to uh, race the cars. But, of course, they did. And that's when uh, they uh, uh, hung on during the race, um, uh, fought through some mechanical problems, and at the end of it, they had a win in, in Class B, and they won the team prize, they won the cor uh, production uh, car uh, prize, and uh, John Fitch made the f uh, wonderful statement is, we got less than, than we hoped for, but more than we deserved. And they had uh, an outstanding finish, and that finish uh, set the, the uh, direction for the Corvette. If they had not done respectably well in that uh, uh, event, the car would have taken an entirely different turn than it did, uh, you know, now that we, we know the car uh, in history. It's still a high-performance sports car. It's still ready for the road or ready for the track. And uh, uh, if it hadn't been for Fitch, it could have uh, just as easily uh, become another Thunderbird. In 1960, John's association with Briggs Cunningham once again brought him seat time in a Corvette. Cunningham brought a three-car team to Le Mans. Uh, actually, at one time, it was raining, and uh, uh, Fitch took the car up to a third uh, overall, ahead of many of the sports racer. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, the last, lost the position back as the track dried, and, and the faster cars were able to apply their power. But uh, towards the end of the race, came into the uh, pits and unfortunately uh, one of the guys from uh, Detroit took off the radiator cap and a lot of the coolant uh, boiled out and um, uh, they weren't able to uh, uh, replace it and so uh, what to do? Well Bill, Bill Frick, one of the, the uh, uh, great mechanics on, on that team, uh, had an idea. He'd packed the, the uh, engine with ice from a, a Coca-Cola chest and there was ice everywhere, and, and it came back in uh, uh, 
every so often uh, when it started to heat up. And finally, they got down to the very last, and uh, uh, there were uh, two laps to go. They had an advisor, Johnny Baus, who said, uh, go as slow as you can and only take one lap and uh, go under the checkered flag uh, just after the, the 4 o'clock time limit. And that's exactly what they did. Remarkably, the Fitch Grossman number 3 finished 8th overall and 1st in class, well ahead of many of Europe's finest racing machines. I think he's the highest finishing Corvette racing driver ever at Le Mans, even to this day. In 66, John retired from the pursuit he so dearly loved. And although his racing days were over, his pursuits were still in full swing. John Fitch called me, I think it was about 1988, and asked if I would help him put together his special backwards race car. So we took a uh, celebrity that had four-wheel steer on it. It was a development car at the time we were working on four-wheel steering. And we blocked out the front wheels from steering so that when you turn the steering wheel, you were actually steering the back wheels and not the front wheels. And then we uh, took the transmission and turned it around so that when you were backing it up, you actually had three speeds in reverse and only one going forward. So the car would virtually go 80, 90, 100 miles an hour in reverse. So we thought this, this would make the uh, perfect car for John to drive. At least he thought so. Early on in his career, he was involved with, uh, as the only American race driver to race for the Mercedes team, uh, was very close at hand when there was a very tragic accident at Le Mans. And I think it affected how he looked at racing after that. Plus, understand that in the 50s, many of these men saw their close friends dying, sometimes more than one a weekend. And if you survived uh, four or five years of professional racing in the early 50s, you were blessed. Um, many of the great race drivers are no longer with us. Anyway, John uh, spent from the mid-50s, the last four decades, literally campaigning not only racing safety, but safety on the American highways, on the highways of the world. He is the inventor of what they call the Fitch Barriers, which are the sand-filled drums that you see along the American highways and the interstate system. That was not an easy thing to get the, um, the powers to be to accept, but he was successful at that, and uh, he holds a number of patents in that kind of area. He has been campaigning for racetrack safety and racing safety for the last 40 years, and it's still uh, something that he's very, very involved with and like a, a man 30 years younger, looking to the future to try to make changes to what's done and how things are done in racing as well as in highway safety. Ladies and gentlemen, 